Humanity's existence on Earth has been, for the most part, a dark one. For thousands of years, we lived our short lives scrubbing the dirt for sustenance, producing barely enough to feed ourselves and our families, let alone search for enlightenment and success outside of the small world that we knew. Pestilence and poverty were everywhere. The literate few and far between and living standards were appallingly low. This got better over time, of course. Ancient Mesopotamia created camels and nurtured the parched sand. China created great walls that spilled across the land, and ancient Rome's legions basically wrecked everyone. But these advancements were few and far between and came in tiny increments. This was a pattern that lasted for thousands of years until the 19th century. This graph shows the social development of the East and the West over the course of much of human history. As you can see, although there are occasionally some slight peaks and falls in the line, there are generally no dramatic increases in development until we reach the 19th century, upon which something causes an extremely abrupt major increase in social development, energy capture, and the overall standard of living. This was the, um, this was the Industrial Revolution in all of its suiting and elegant glory the great catalyst which launched humanity into such a meteoric increase. Now, before the Industrial Revolution, mankind obtained all of our energy through our own state, own strength, or by harnessing the abilities of animals. However, this relies on sheer physical force put a maximum limit of hard seating on how much energy we had, had at our disposal and consequently on how much society could develop. The Industrial Revolution got around this by using fossil fuels to fuel machines. By referring back to my graph, we can see that the Song Dynasty and the Roman Empire, point B and C, also reached the highest seating. So that raises the question, why exactly did the Industrial Revolution happen in England, but not in Rome or China? Let me introduce you to Stanford history professor Ian Morris's um, question of the apocalypse theory, which states that civilization begins to decline and fall when the following factors converge upon it. Climate change, famine, state failure, migration, and disease. Four out of the five forces of the apocalypse, or about climate change, brought the, East, the Western Roman Empire crashing down in the fifth century, before it had the time and opportunities to make the inventions and innovations necessary to break past the hard ceiling, escape the um, course of the apocalypse, and enter a new era. On the other hand, none of the horses of the apocalypse approached England as approached the hard ceiling of development that brought Rome and China crashing down. Hence, great men such as industrial pioneers Edmund Cartwright and James Watt had the time and opportunities to come up with great ideas. Thus, humanity was able to trigger an industrial revolution, break past the hard ceiling, and start a huge rise in social development and energy capture. To this day, social development and energy capture are still rising as they never have before. In the past, um, if social, de um, social development and energy capture are predicted to rise twice as much as it has in the previous 15,000 years by 20. 65, and double again by 2150. The implications of this are staggering. Between the end of the Ice Age and the beginning of the 21st century, social development and energy capture rose by 900 points. But according to the graph, it will rise by another 4,000 in the next 100 years alone. That's incredible. If 900 points took us from uh, stone clubs to atomic bombs, from crude drawings on, wall, on cables to the iPhone 6S, where will 4,000? Let's look at this on the following levels of social development. Urbanization, energy capture, um, in information technology, and warming capacity. The average global energy capture per individual is expected to rise from 50,000 kilocalories to a stunning 1.3 million by the end of the 21st century. We will definitely leave fossil fuels behind as we run out and are unable to support our needs. Populations are also expected to skyrocket, and as individuals move away from urban and rural regions, um, from suburban and rural regions, in favor of urban places, huge cities will form. 
20 times the size of Hong Kong, with populations of up to 140 million people, the size of the seven largest cities in the world today combined. Warming us, as China's warming in capacity and spending on military development increases, and its pace to match the U.S. very, very soon, it is not a surprise that warming capacity is also expected to rise exponentially. Nanotechnology will transform the most mundane of household objects into murderous weapons or impenetrable defenses. We will play smaller and smaller roles in direct warfare as we send soldiers of silicon and steel to die in our stead, and anti-bomb and missile ships will defend us from weapons that could obliterate the world today twice over. But most understandingly, and interestingly, information technology is developing at an almost alarming rate. Moore's law, an observation made in the 1970s, which states that the overall processing capacity of computers will double every two years, has held true thus far, allowing humanity to go from clunky telegraphs to speak smartphones in a matter of decades. But as we approach the limits imposed by the laws of physics, for no signal can travel faster than the speed of light, and no transmitter can be thinner than a single atom. This development is shifting into stranger allies. A popular theory is that the 21st century will lead us all into the singularity, a situation in which all the minds in the developed country will be connected in a single huge supercomputer with information with the processing capacity thousands of times greater than the sum of all the minds in the world today. With barely a flicker of your mind, you'd be able to access all the information in the world. Surely, the implications of this are absolutely astonishing. Populations seemingly impossible to sustain, weapons straight out of the pages of a science fiction novel, and technology that may dehumanize us. Humanity is drawing ever closer to a new hard ceiling. As we finish using up the last vestiges of fossil fuels upon this world, as we continue to slow cook our planet and as the horses of the apocalypse draw ever nearer to us. The first horsemen of the apocalypse to arrive this kind of change. Humanity's reckless, abrupt industrialization has jettisoned tons of fossil fuels, no, has jettisoned tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. The O the overall temperature of the planet is expected to rise um, by 2 to 6 degrees Celsius. The natural disasters, droughts, and overall and rising sea levels this will cause is expected to summon another horse in the apocalypse, that of famine. That in turn will cause state failure as governments find themselves unable to provide for their people, such as in countries like Ethiopia where drought has caused famine to happen and the government is unable to cope with this. Furthermore, this will also spur migration as people desperate to escape the drought-ridden, desperate countries that they live in shift to other countries today. A country such as Syria is a prime example of this which is already happening in the status quo. Europe is already being overwhelmed by the wave of refugees fleeing from Syria. Imagine the same situation on a scale thousands of times greater than the one we see today, as people from tropical countries all over the world escape and leave. On top of all of this, the World Health Organization predicts that a huge pandemic will strike the globe in the next few decades. Humanity has not seen such a disaster happen since the days of the Black Death and the Great Plagues. So what will happen? Will we, like the like, will we succeed like Britain did in the 18th century? Or will we collapse and fall? Nobody really knows. All we really know is in the end, a great frontier lies before us. And although we may not know what lies beyond it, a great shadow is forming behind us. And as the clatter of hoofbeats draw ever nearer, we must change. As Michael Collins once said, adventure is not a choice, not really. It is an imperative. Thank you.